And so all I'm really predicting, at least for now, is another average year, about a 10% gain in gold. And then extrapolate that out to silver, maybe 15, maybe 20% in silver. Now everybody wants, you know, I want it to go up 100%. I want it to go up 100%. What am I saying? But I just don't expect that this year. There's just a lot going on. And the Fed is going to act to try to keep as much stability as possible into the election and through all the geopolitics and everything that goes with it. Now we get to 2025 and we'll see where we go from there. But I would think for this year, with the Fed finally pausing and then pivoting, we will get that breakout above 2100 that I was looking for last year, a rally of probably 10% up to about 2300 some point this year before settling back by the end of the year. Despite a relatively slow start to the year, after hitting a record annual price in 2023, analysts see the potential for the precious metal to achieve another record this year, according to the latest survey from the London Bullion Market Association. Member analysts of the LBMA see the gold market achieving a record annual price of $2,059 an ounce this year, an increase of 6.1% compared to $1,940.54 an ounce achieved last year. Craig Hemke, an analyst known for his insights into the precious metals market, predicts gold will reach $2,300 before settling, while silver is expected to move toward a $28 target in the longer term. He advises caution against drastic price spikes in the gold market, foreseeing a 10% gain in gold and up to a 20% increase in silver. Natasha Kaneva is the head of global commodities strategy at JP Morgan. Across commodities for the second consecutive year, the only structural bullish call we hold is for gold and silver. Meanwhile, Craig points out recent gold market fluctuations tied to changing rate cut expectations. Gold prices dropped in the U.S. hours contrasting with the rise during Asian and London hours. Gold prices climbed to a two-week high on Tuesday, supported by a softer dollar and lower treasury yields, while focus turned to the Federal Reserve's policy meeting for insight into how soon it will cut interest rates this year. Now, we present the clips of Craig Hemke's insights from his recent interview with Liberty and Finance. Before we continue to delve into this discussion, please subscribe to our channel and activate the bell icon for timely updates. But over the previous... 10 days, the price of gold as it's traded on the COMEX has plunged dramatically between about the 8.30 Eastern open and maybe 10 o'clock. All of that coinciding with maybe some stronger than expected inflation or economic data. And that has caused a reset of those, infl or those rate cut expectations. So during US hours over the last couple of weeks and really this entire month of January, the price of gold has gone down. But over the Asian and London hours, it's been rising. And the two have kind of counterbalanced each other. And gold is year to date, maybe down $10 as we wrap up the month. So you've got this kind of bifurcated thing where physical buying is driving price in Asia and into London. But as soon as the price action shifts to New York, we get these headlines. The machines that trade, the HFT machines that trade COMEX futures see those headlines and see the changes in the rate cut expectations and they dump their, their gold and silver contracts. It's very interesting to watch. You know, sometimes those machines are driven by changes in nominal interest rates, you know, bond market moving up and down. Sometimes, a lot of times during the day, they're driven by the dollar index. But right now, the only thing that seems to matter are those in rate cut expectations. How soon will the Fed start to cut? Um, again, may still be March. Curve's starting to look more like it might be May. We played this game last year and they made it all the way through the year. I don't think they'll do it again this year. Gold is waiting for that shift, that that shift back to cutting. And that'll start generating the positive momentum and the interest in gold that should push it finally through 2100. But we're just not there yet. Now, gold has rallied this century uh, from what, $300 to $2,100? And if you annualize it out over the first 23 years of the century, it annualizes about 9% a year. Okay, so it's not that price can't go up. It's just that it, it's not profitable for the banks that manage the markets to have it go up 50% in a year. Okay, they can handle 10. 50 would be a disaster. And so all I'm really predicting, at least for now, is another average year, about a 10% gain in gold. And then extrapolate that out to silver, maybe 15, maybe 20 percent in silver. Now, everybody wants, you know, I want it to go up 100 percent. I want it to go up 100 percent. What am I saying? But I just don't expect that this year. There's just a lot going on. And the Fed is going to act 
to try to keep as much stability as possible into the election and through all the geopolitics and everything that goes with it. Now, we get to 2025, and we'll see where we go from there. But I would think for this year, with the Fed finally pausing and then pivoting, we will get that breakout above 2100 that I was looking for last year, a rally of probably 10% up to about 2300 at some point this year before settling back by the end of the year. Silver has that same trading range that gold's been in, but it's having even a more difficult time of breaking out. I, it has to get above 26 before it can even think about getting above 28. I think that move to 26 will happen this year, but I'm not sure it'll break out above 28 yet. Once it does, once it starts trading with a, you know, a number that begins with a three again, okay, then we're going to start having some fun. But I don't expect that to happen just yet, which gives everybody still more time to accumulate physical metal at prices that are still pretty reasonable. Craig Hemke expressed optimism about gold's ascent, anticipating it positively influencing silver. Traditionally, the gold-silver ratio ranged from 12 ratio 1 to 16 ratio 1, but the current ratio of 90 ratio 1, as per Hemke, indicates substantial leverage. Silver rallies as the gold-silver ratio pulls back below 87.50. From a big picture point of view, the gold-silver ratio continues to move lower after an unsuccessful attempt to settle above the 92 level. Craig warned of the worsening U.S. debt crisis, expecting a return to quantitative easing and yield curve control by the Federal Reserve to address increasing debt costs. The Fed initiated a second extensive QE program due to the pandemic, and its holdings of debt securities peaked at $8.5 trillion in 2022, up from $3.8 trillion pre-pandemic, currently at $7.2 trillion. This ratcheting effect significantly inflated asset values beyond fundamental levels, with a lasting positive impact. Moreover, he anticipated silver opportunities, but is uncertain about a substantial surge this year, expressing openness to it reaching $100. Let's get back to the interview. That's kind of the creation of traders, you know, and people that play that ratio. It gets closer to 100. You start swapping into more silver from gold. It goes back down to 70. You go back out of gold back in uh, or go out of silver back into gold that's that sort of thing to me again yeah historically that ratio has been reflective of of the available supply or what's in the ground for gold and silver and something 12 to 1 16 to 1 something like that the fact that it's 90 to 1 gives you some idea of the leverage involved you know in creation of all these different digital forms of precious metal in both gold and silver um under this current system, people follow it, though, and we get frustrated because, as you said, silver just kind of trades sideways. You know, it's down 50 percent from its highs. It's up 50 percent from its lows, however you want to look at it. Um, and people think it's never going to break out. No, maybe it won't. I don't know. But I do think gold will. And demand for gold is so strong at the central bank level and just from institutions and funds and high net worth people, the demand for physical gold is not going to go away. So as gold continues higher, it almost has to drag silver higher by virtue of that gold silver ratio. Let's say uh, a couple years from now, gold's trading. Uh, you pick a number, Elijah, $3,000 an ounce. Well, a gold silver ratio at 100 implies $30 silver. You know, and if you think that's, you know, crazy, well, maybe it should be 80. Well, what does that imply? 35, 40 dollars silver? So I just can't imagine that silver won't tag along if at least if I'm right about gold. And so that presents an opportunity in silver. I'm, I'm again, I'm not sure. I'd love to see it. Believe, don't get me wrong. I mean, all the silver I've got, I want silver to go to 50 and 100 too. But I'm not sure that's coming yet this year. Um, again, Hopefully it does, but I think this year is more of an opportunity of recognizing that there is a floor under price, and every time price tends to dip, it's an opportunity to acquire more physical ahead of what's to come eventually. So we're now running $2 trillion annual deficits in the U.S., $508 billion in the first quarter alone. Interest to service the existing debt at $34 trillion plus, we pay more in the U.S., to service the debt and interest costs than we do in our military budget. It's the second largest line item behind the entitlement spending. 
And that's just going to get more and more out of control. We're in that kind of terminal exponential phase of this debt crisis. Okay, you just have to borrow more to keep the plate spinning. Your borrowing costs go up. If interest rates go up, they go up that much faster. Ultimately, what this will lead to is renewed quantitative easing where the debt is actually just straight up monetized by the Fed. And they'll probably do it through some form of yield curve control policy. The Fed instituted that back in the 40s and the early 50s to try to get the debt under control coming out of World War II. The Japanese have been playing this game since the 1990s. Okay, that's where the Fed is headed as well, where they just simply say, look, the U.S. government can't afford this level of interest rates. We are a buyer of all treasuries, anything above 3%. And they'll create just a cap on interest rates above which the Fed just says they'll buy everything. That's what yield curve control does. That is, again, more quantitative easing. That's more fiat money creation, uh, devaluation of the currency that leads to higher and higher gold prices. That's the only way out. You know, I... I I just I think it's funny. I've read so much analysis of people that think Powell is somehow fighting for the little guy, right? He's going to sit here and he's going to uh, raise rates as high as he has to. Hell, that's what the FOMC minutes said today, or the Fed, the headline said today. Oh, we're not going to cut rates until we see inflation get under control. That's pretty easy to say when the markets are still afloat and the regional banks are still afloat, and there's at least there's enough cash for now in the Treasury to pay the interest and fund the government. But when push comes to shove and the markets begin to crash because liquidity is dried up, I don't care what the inflation rate is, Powell's going to cut interest rates and he's going to restart QE and put on yield curve control. Because in the end, he doesn't care about the masses. What matters to him is what happens to the banks and to the federal government. That's who he is beholden to and that's who he will serve. And he will be cutting rates and he will be starting the money printing machine again just to keep the everything spinning. That's what they've chosen every single time there's been a crisis since 2008, that's what they'll continue to do this year, too. The LBMA survey shows analysts are relatively split on the main drivers for gold prices this year. According to the results, 25% expect U.S. monetary policy to be the most significant factor. At the same time, in a tie, 22% either expect central bank demand or geopolitical risk to drive prices. What are your thoughts on the future of precious metals amid these dynamics? Share your thoughts in the comment section below. If you find this video informative, don't forget to support our channel and turn on notifications to stay informed about our latest videos. See you in the next video.